Bueno, uno, veréis, eh, está Jaraito Codeu, Nick Gaur, Emena Saldo Codisuetena, y Sango da Laburki, eh, bueno, me empecé a Dituek. Ahí está todo que al dar technological changes that uh, occurred in this um, context, and I'm going to be concentrated concentrating specifically on the changes that happened in our region in the Basque Country, and I'm going to be therefore telling you uh, about that uh, um, context we had in the Basque Country at the time. Uh, will um, I will mainly focus on uh, three main activities, um, the naval uh, activity, naval uh, ship uh, building uh, concerning trade, uh, and then I will concentrate also on fishing, and uh, I will mention uh, basically, and I also mentioned forestry, forestry activity that was very closely linked to shipbuilding. As I was saying now in Basque, well, he's going to be repeating the same thing in Spanish. We will continue just in case you were not listening, dear English speakers. I will be telling you mostly about the period between the mid-15th and the mid-16th centuries. That's uh, the period that uh, we are addressing during our conference today and tomorrow. So, without further ado, uh, let's go for it. We're talking about this period, this time in history with huge technological changes. And if you allow me, I would like to uh, summarize them in as three main areas of change. The first one uh, would involve replacing the larger uh, vessels, huge tonnage, uh, replacing them. They, they were replaced, uh, more or less, in the mid-15th century by smaller ships. The second major change, uh, mostly in the Atlantic area, uh, we have that uh, big change uh, in the shipbuilding techniques, where up until the mid-15th century, uh, we mostly saw the clinker technique, such as the in the Newport Rec or Ornieta Rec, whereas after that uh, time, more and more, we have uh, the Carvel style. The next change, a major change, happened uh, in the 16th century. Here in the Basque Country, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we saw uh, ships growing larger and larger at Basque shipyards. So, those would be the main technological landmarks uh, that uh, I would like to highlight for that period. I mentioned during my introduction how Basque, the Basque fleet uh, was one of the leading uh, fleets in Europe. In the early Middle Ages, uh, we have historical data and sources talking about Basque transport and Basque, uh, Basque trade uh, and their presence uh, both in the Atlantic Ocean and in the Med Mediterranean Sea. There are people uh, today and tomorrow who will refer more about uh, that presence uh, in the Western Atlantic area. And so I would leave that to them. And then in the first half of the 16th century, or even in the second half as well, uh, we see 
that uh, clear pres presence uh, of Basque vessels uh, as part of the uh, civilian monopoly of trade uh, in the Indies in that route. We see Basque ships there as well. So, I will uh, just mention some of the landmarks and important events, uh, chronologically speaking, that are connected uh, with history and uh, with these technological changes in shipbuilding. Techniques also changed uh, because uh, of certain events in the Basque Country that had an impact uh, on that technological change or evolution. Most um, experts uh, talk about the relevance of the Basque fleet in the Mediterranean as from the 14th century. That's when Basque merchant ships appear more and more in the Western Mediterranean area. And not only that, uh, during the 15th century, Basque merchant ships uh, were uh, the leaders in pl places or ports like Barcelona, Genoa, uh, so once again, uh, Basque merchant ships uh, were at the forefront of that industry. So what, what were Basques, in fact? Were they... Um, just uh, dealing with the transport side of things, or were they uh, merchants and tradesmen? Well, sources just talk about Basque vessels uh, taking cargo between Iberian coast, the Iberian coast, and uh, different areas in northern Europe, for instance. In other cases, uh, between the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, uh, in other cases, uh, mentions are made between uh, of, of voyages between the Atlantic uh, and the Mediterranean. And then also, uh, we read about, in these sources, uh, we read about uh, merchants uh, who uh, don't just uh, work with transport uh, but also with trade and mostly connected with iron and with iron ore because it's iron ore uh, that was the product uh, that was produced in the Basque country uh, and then had to be uh, sold and transported uh, in those uh, routes and networks I described for the early Middle Ages. Then, more or less, uh, in the mid-15th century, uh, the situation started to change. One of the reasons is that uh, some of the main ports in the Mediterranean uh, started uh, to uh, have their own fleets, for instance in Genoa, in Marseille, in Barcelona, that was the case, and then they didn't need uh, those Basque vessels anymore. Uh, Basque vessels were rep replaced by a local fleet. At that time, uh, Basque ships then focused more and more in uh, the Mediterranean area in southern Spain. We see uh, more and more Basque vessels and uh, tradesmen, mostly in the last few decades uh, of the 15th century routes between uh, southern Spain in Andalusia and the British Isles, for instance. At that time, 
the Basque presence is very much felt uh, in cities uh, like San Lucar, Cadiz, Seville, in southern Spain, in Andalusia, and uh, there were certain institutions uh, like the Association of uh, Pilots uh, and Captains, Sea Captains in Cadiz where training, training was given uh, for um, these professionals but sailing both in the Mediterranean and, and in the Atlantic. So those cities and institutions uh, seem to have uh, very much favoured uh, Basque uh, professionals uh, who uh, were living in Andalusia at the time, sailors and pilots and captains. And as I said, uh, this uh, Andalusian association uh, very much favoured, for instance, Vizcayan uh, sailors and captains. The time when Basque interests uh, grew uh, in southern Spain, in Andalusia. For maritime pilots, in this case, we have to connect that uh, we have to see how that connects with trade as well because up until that time uh, they both trade and transport uh, seem to have to have gone very much hand in hand but uh, after that time they um, kind of specialized and separated which was uh, totally the case uh, in the 16th century at the time of the large uh, voyages and discoveries, discoveries such as Elcanos, Elcanos and Magellan. And not just specialization and separation, but sometimes conflict. So those uh, ship owners that uh, wanted to focus on transport at that time the sources uh, point uh, to larger ships they seem to have favoured larger ships although that's not a simple conclusion to reach one of the reasons uh, why Basque vessels were favoured in the Mediterranean uh, was quite simply because Basque vessels were smaller than uh, the normal uh, Genoese vessels. So these smaller or medium-sized vessels were uh, very much favoured by tradesmen uh, in general in the Mediterranean area. Uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, the size of the vessels seems to have been smaller even in the Basque country. That was uh, the reason of the conflict. Uh, more and more, in the 16th century, uh, tradesmen uh, wanted smaller ships, wanted to fleet smaller ships. It was more profitable for them. Uh, one of the reasons was uh, because the insurance policy they had to uh, pay uh, was uh, totally directly proportional uh, to the size of the ship. So, uh, tradesmen who wanted uh, to go from one port to another uh, with different scales, uh, then they might want a larger ship. But uh, 
Somebody uh, who just wanted to take iron ore from the Basque country to Andalusia and for the ship to come back uh, with fruit from Andalusia or from northern Africa or from the Mediterranean basin because uh, Andalusia was very much a redistribution hub, then those uh, people or those uh, would prefer uh, to hire a smaller ship. One more reason has to do with timing. Loading a smaller ship uh, is uh, a lot quicker than loading a much larger tonnage ship. And uh, we often read in the sources uh, how ships sometimes had to wait at the port uh, for months, uh, which was not uh, particularly useful uh, for tradesmen. So, uh, all of those reasons uh, you can understand uh, are, were sources of confrontation at that time during that historical period. So, this conflict uh, grew and grew uh, even larger uh, because of the age or era of discoveries and expeditions to Africa, for instance, to Guinea, uh, where, once again, smaller vessels were favoured. Uh, these expeditions to sometimes rather uncharted territory uh, and uh, to areas where port uh, facilities were not particularly good, then all of that once again favoured smaller vessels for those activities. And then after 1492, the time when trade uh, and uh, transport was important uh, with America, between Andalusia and America, at that initial period, once again, smaller vessels made more sense. Uh, it was uh, a newfound land. Uh, so for those few decades, it made more sense uh, to have smaller ships during that uh, first initial period in the West Indies fleet. And when I say smaller ships, by the way, I'm talking about uh, probably uh, under 150 tons or even quite a bit lower than that. So, as a result of all of those reasons, the trade industry sorry, sorry, uh, asked the crown, the Spanish crown, for help. In uh, 1500, uh, Isabel and Ferdinand, uh, the Spanish king and queen, uh, issued a new bill saying that uh, local ships uh, would be favoured uh, to, uh, as opposed to foreign ships, and smaller ships uh, would be favoured uh, rather than larger ships. The Catholic monarchs, the Spanish crown, uh, also wanted to have uh, the larger ships uh, with uh, greater tonnage uh, available uh, for whatever they might need. Uh, 1511, that was the time uh, when the consulate uh, was settled in Bilbao, and at that time uh, that dispute grew into an open confrontation. The transport industry uh, once again, asked uh, the Spanish crown uh, to favour larger vessels, and uh, because of that, uh, tradesmen and merchants, uh, under the umbrella of the consulates in Bilbao, uh, lobbied uh, and pushed to make sure that uh, 
changes would not affect their vested interests. Transport professionals uh, then once again addressed the Spanish Queen, Isabel of Castile, and we can see here this text uh, with uh, what they asked from them. He's reading 19 to the dozen, saying the uh, merchants and uh, tradespeople ask uh, the Spanish Queen uh, to favor the smaller vessels. So once again, uh, what I explained earlier, uh, in uh, the trade industry, smaller vessels were favorite. And what's going to happen here? Well, especially um, smaller vessels will be built, and therefore larger vessels will not be built anymore, since they will have no use at all from then on. It is also true that uh, this practice in the first decades of the 16th uh, century was quite common. Um, this, was n this new law was not um, fulfilled 100%. Change doesn't happen overnight. Some time elapsed before it did. Uh, in any case, we can see that in different, uh, that there are different towns that go uh, to see the king and queen to get ex exemptions from this new standard. The town of uh, Fuenterrabia will ask the court uh, for this exemption and will get it, which means that the vessels of Fuenterrabia will not have to abide by this legislation that favors larger boats, which means that uh, merchants can fleet freely um, boats coming from uh, Fuente Rabia, uh, even if they're smaller, and the larger ones cannot do anything about it. So this exemption that is uh, given to Fuente Rabia will be expanded in 1932, to the different neighborhoods and villages depending from uh, the town of Fuente Rabia, but which use the harbor of Pasajes, Pasajes de San Juan and Lezo, the citizens of these two areas, for instance. Uh, that uh, uh, use the main port of Guipúzcoa will also be exempt from uh, uh, abiding by this piece of legislation, which means that they can transport in their smaller vessels um, any cargo, uh, and this means that larger uh, ship owners cannot do anything about it. On top of this, the uh, merchants will um, use any opportunity they have in this context, in this political and economical context, to impose uh, their interest, to lobby and before uh, the uh, transport industry. Uh, good example of this are trade uh, um, agreements. I don't know, there was a military conflict between different uh, kingdoms where it was affecting Castile, England, France, etc. In the 14th century. And the inhabitants of uh, both sides of the Bidasoa River, um, that is, um, inhabitants of uh, French and Spanish uh, Basque Country had agreements between them to guarantee uh, and support good um, trading relationships and to avoid actions by pirates, military actions between them. If this was a way to protect their vessels. We know that uh, some of these treaties were signed, some of these agreements were signed at the beginning, uh, early in the 14th century, and then early in the 16th century there was a confrontation between France and Spain, and we know that another agreement of this type was signed back then. In, nine, in 1529, one of these agreements was still valid, and uh, one of these confrontations between uh, Francis I and Charles I uh, in 15 
1936 led to um, new negotiations between representatives of the province of Gipuzkoa, Vizcaya, the four uh, towns of uh, the current province of Cantabria and representatives from the province of Labor and Bayon. And they all uh, came to Andai in order to negotiate a new agreement, a new uh, trade agreement. And they come to an agreement and they, they stated that, well, amongst many other things, of course, um, they stated that if any of the inhabitants of these uh, places, Bayona, Laborca, Breton, uh, Guipúzcoa, Vizcaya, and Cuatro Villas loaded their cargo in sheep, in sheep that would not belong to um, local sheep owners, <coughs> this would mean in this, in this first treaty that they're uh, signing, they're protecting, again, their vessels, but cargo would not be protected, the cargo that is loaded on vessels coming from other territories. So if a merchant from San Sebastian loaded uh, cargo on a ship coming from La Rochelle, the um, corsairs from Biscay could get hold of that vessel and that merchant would lose the cargo since the cargo is not protected by the, the agreement. The agreement would only protect, it would only cover the uh, vessel. And this is a moment where conflict begins again because representatives from Cuatro Villas and representatives from Bilbao will not sign um, this. And uh, given this situation, representatives from Bilbao go to Andaya to meet representatives from Laborde, Bayonne and Camp Breton and uh, they would come to another agreement that finally will uh, meet everyone's needs. And this agreement will be signed in 1537. In this last uh, agreement, uh, at the last, very last minute, uh, the agreement includes the fact that all cargo from merchants coming from the signing territories would be exempt from a tax, which means that if corsairs get hold of a, a, a vessel from Galicia loaded with Gipuzkoan products, well, they can keep the vessel, but uh, the cargo needs to be given back to its owner, because the cargo in this case will be protected. So you see that little by little, merchants uh, lobby more and more versus uh, transport professionals. This would be a point, an important point of these uh, of the words coming later. Um, but this was the last treaty, the last agreement signed in the 16th century. After this uh, um, agreement, no more agreements will be signed by the territories on both sides of the Vidasoa River. And uh, what will happen then? Well, merchants will try and get the king to give uh, trading permissions. And uh, from 1543-44, uh, 1550-51, uh, instead of authorizing agreements, the king will be allowing the arrival of French vessels with very specific cargo and will uh, allow the vessels to be loaded with return cargo uh, products that have been made in the Basque Country. So uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, the fleet uh, is no longer protected 
o que se prefieran los mayores so, um, Efectivamente, si estamos autorizando a barcos franceses if you're authorizing French vessels loaded with very specific cargo that are considered to be strategic uh, whether they are uh, whether it is weed or um, textiles or anything that is needed for shipbuilding or uh, food uh, and um, they can um, load um, whale oil or iron uh, back to France and so uh, this is now a new situation since we have uh, these vessels that are authorized to uh, take all these products then the uh, transport industry will decline along the 16th century not just for all these reasons but also for um, the fact that America was discovered on the one hand and um, on, on the other hand there were more profitable activities that are, will be imposed in the country, for instance, uh, uh, fishing in Newfoundland or uh, the West Indies fleet, and the uh, profit there would be much higher uh, versus uh, transport. And on top of this, in the Mediterranean area, uh, let's not forget it, we have uh, the Turkish and Berber offensive in Western Mediterranean area that will cover the routes used by transport um, professionals and therefore they will be abandoned. The last attempt uh, by, made by the transport industry will occur in 1560 on making the most of meeting of uh, the uh, court of Castilla in Toledo. They would ask again, uh, they would ask the court to ask the king to um, um, pass legislation to favor larger boats. As a result of this process, um, um, how shall I put it, there's this psychotic situation that um, occurs, especially around the, the court, because the arguments that were used by transport professionals, i.e. that there are less and less vessels, that less and less vessels are built, that we have foreign vessels, etc., etc., uh, all these arguments will generate this idea that um, shipbuilding is in decline in the Basque Country. The answer given by the Crown, uh, and you may know it, um, uh, they sent Cristobal de Barros uh, to the uh, area, to the Basque Country area. Uh, and he will go to the Basque Coast uh, to uh, carry out a survey in order to find out what's going on. And he will carry out some research there and then he will issue a report at the end of this process where he will explain the measures that he considers that would be interested in order to favor and foster shipbuilding. In any case, Cristobal de Barros's words are very significant and I quote, well, he's, he's in this case he's studying the main causes of the situation since many of the smaller boats that existed 30 years ago don't exist anymore. So here he's saying that there are less and less small boats compared to 30 years before. But he's just speaking about small boats. Look at that. He's not mentioning larger vessels here. And here we have um, an issue uh, with the terminology. When he uses this word, this term now, he can see he's uh, covering um, vessels with the, with a specific dimension, uh, larger vessels. 
se utiliza la palabra he uses the term now, para now sobre todo a to refer a to general, larger vessels a las 100, 150 uh, with more than 100-150 tons. And therefore, navio, and the, you, they use the term um, caravel, etc., to um, 150, mean uh, or to cover vessels below this uh, weight. So when he says smaller boats, he's not actually mentioning or meaning um, boats that have that weight less than 100 tons, but rather uh, vessels between 100 and 200 uh, tons. I've got here some tables, some lists featuring um, a number of different vessels that uh, reflect very well the evolution that uh, occurred uh, in terms of weight uh, and tons. Uh, we have here a list of um, ships uh, from 1534 and the, another list from dating from 1562. And we see here, I'm going to use my glasses, I'm sorry, because without my glasses I can't read anything. Uh, what we see here is that um, in these early decades of the 16th century, we mainly have uh, vessels, uh, mid-sized vessels, small uh, vessels, mentioned by Cristóbal de Barros in his quote. And they would represent half of the fleet of Guipúzcoa, mid-sized uh, vessels that were considered to uh, or were used for transport, transport mainly. Uh, if we look at the list dating from 1562, we see, and I forgot the total number of uh, uh, vessels, the total is uh, slightly reduced, uh, I can t give you the figures. I believe I've got it somewhere here in my notes. I don't, sorry. I'm sorry. I thought I had it. There's a difference of uh, 10 vessels, 10 less in 1562. Slight decrease, but we see that the uh, tons have evolved a lot. Predominant. You see here that uh, by 1562 we have mainly vessels beyond 200 tons. You see here the percentage we had in 1532. The percentage moves. Well, the weight of the uh, vessels evolves and is uh, larger or greater in 1562. And the vessels that uh, are called pinazas uh, in, the, uh, in the papers uh, are vessels that don't reach 60 tons and that. Uh, uh, never reach 80 tons, definitely. We see that uh, there is an increase in, in that type of vessels, which are precisely the ships that will take away cargoes from uh, larger boats, which uh, are the ones that cover the routes between Basque Country and Andalusia, transporting um, iron or maybe wool between the uh, Basque coast and the Flemish coast. It's this type of uh, small uh, vessels that cover those uh, routes. In the past, uh, therefore, the situation was different and there is a decline in this type of vessels. If we look at the destinations of, of the ships, I think uh, this is very telling. We see the destinations of the uh, 1534 fleet. I'm sorry for this. I keep uh, skipping uh, slides. Uh, we see here that in 1534 we have mainly uh, vessels devoted to transport. And the fleet is mainly used for transporting purposes. And the second activity would be fishing here. 
Eh, That's for 1534, as I say. And then we see that uh, the vessels that um, transport cargo between the Atlantic Sea and the Mediterranean Sea uh, the ones who are, are requiring uh, mid-size uh, vessels, vessels between 100 to 100 tons, and also beyond that. This is what we see in 1534, this transport route. Um, in the 60s, in 1562, this will change, and here we will have mainly um, larger boats um, with more than 200 tons, and the larger ones uh, with more than 300 tons will be devoted to the West Indies fleet, and then about 16 ships will uh, cover fishing in Newfoundland, and there are eight more vessels between 100 and 200 tons that also fish in Newfoundland. And then we have smaller boats which uh, will be used for transport. As for fishing, this uh, is also a uh, relevant activity in the Middle Ages. It will grow. Um, the first reference to it in the papers are the ones uh, included. Uh, in 1354, by the Association of Fishermen of Bermeo, um, and there are some fishing expeditions um, to the British Islands. And you see here in, on the table in 1534, uh, there's an important uh, fleet of uh, fishing boats that uh, uh, travel to Irish waters, and then a small amount of vessels that are used for whale hunting in Galicia. Um, we don't have Newfoundland here in 1534 on the, the uh, list of vessels. We don't have any ship uh, that uh, is used in, from the uh, in Newfoundland. It doesn't mean they didn't go there. But it is also true that up until the 40s, it would seem that uh, expeditions to Newfoundland are not that uh, common, really. I wouldn't say they are rare, but they're not that common. Eh, Definitely. Um, it calls my attention that we have here mainly um, hake eh, fishing Islandia, activities in Ireland, oh, sorry, in Ireland, eh, eh, uh, compared to whale hunting in uh, Galicia. In the second half of the 16th century, the situation will change because, as you know, um, especially Guipúzcoa will specialize itself in uh, whale hunting. And uh, whalers will be uh, used, whalers uh, beyond 200 tons will uh, be uh, increasing in number in the second half of the 16th century. As for uh, shipbuilding, bueno, vemos que we see here that in early Middle Ages, the uh, development of uh, shipbuilding and other activities, mainly uh, the iron industry, agriculture, um, developed uh, very much in the Basque Country, and all this, of course, had an impact on the woods, because at the end of the day, uh, fuel would come from oak, 
trees and uh, ship would build using uh, European oak trees. Uh, buildings uh, were also made because this is a time of expansion and new towns were built, new buildings were made. There is an expansion uh, from uh, the rural um, in the rural areas. Um, <coughs> and many farmhouses are built uh, using wood as well. So there is a great pressure put on uh, forestry and forest resources. But we don't really see here there's a great concern about uh, forests. What we see um, uh, mainly in the early Middle Ages is that um, kings um, give privileges uh, to very specific uh, activities in order to get wood um, wherever they seem fit. For instance, in to, uh, in 1260, uh, the town of Guetaria got the privilege to cut wood in any mountain of Guipúzcoa, as long as it, 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 it's used for house building or ship building. In any case, these privileges will, um, will foster the iron industry. Uh, for instance, in 1328, uh, the Fuero de Ferrerías was given to the iron makers in the valley of Oyarzun. This was a privilege that was given to them. Um, iron makers can um, get wood in any um, forest belonging to the king in Ipuzcoa. So they can get wood almost anywhere. This is a privilege that 10 years later, in 1338, will be expanded to the whole of the region of Guipúzcoa. And all iron makers in Guipúzcoa will have this privilege and can get wood anywhere they want, as long as the forest belongs to the crown. As you see, um, there's almost no limitation here concerning the use of wood and, uh, up until the end of the uh, 14th century. In late 14th century, it would seem that all this acti shipbuilding activity, iron making activity, will have an impact on uh, forest resources and uh, there will be an impact on timber as well. We see that there are less and less resources, and this is really the, the, uh, very telling. There are decrees in Deva in 1564 uh, that establish a whole series of measures that are not very strict yet, but uh, that uh, make a reference to the management and the use of uh, forestry, forest resources. And uh, the decree establishes that um, wood and timber that is uh, harvested in the land of the, of, the, of the town needs to be carried out by professionals authorized by uh, the council. So things are not that easy anymore. You cannot just go to the uh, forest and cut the wood you need. And uh, this decree bans uh, timber extractions from the territory of Deva to other territories, except if it is used for shipbuilding and uh, build, uh, building construction. For instance, um, timber cannot be taken from Deva to Mutrico, Deva to Zumaya. Um, but this is allowed if it is uh, used for shipbuilding. So um, that's a limitation. There's a banning on charcoal um, production using beech tree timber because this timber is reserved exclusively in order to make planks that are going to be used to make casks. Uh, that would be used in maritime transportation. So there are there's a, there's a whole series of restrictions here um, that will be increased in the 16th century. For instance, the, the local decrees passed in San Sebastian that date back from 1489 state uh, that um, 
There's a well, banning on ship uh, construction that are going to be used in a foreign country. That activity is banned as long as you don't have permission from the council. So you cannot build uh, ships if they are going to be used outside San Sebastian. You need a special permission by the council to do so. And the council would assess whether there are resources for this or not. So there's some control there now in order to limit the, the free use of, of uh, forest resources. And this process will come to uh, its momentum at, uh, in, in uh, late 15th century, early 16th century, when the Crown in 1501 bans selling um, ships to foreign countries. Um, then, of course, you can think that this is not abided by 100%. You know that Elcano himself didn't, didn't uh, abide by this decree, but uh, uh, there was some uh, prohibition applied here in, well, later on. Uh, Charles I would uh, ratify these bans, and the privileges of the uh, um, province of Guipúzcoa would include all these decrees and uh, this legislation in this law seven uh, uh, in, a, in a compilation of privileges in Guipúzcoa. Uh, as I say, the the banning uh, I mean, selling ships to foreign countries is still banned and this banning is included in this legislation. So there's no more free access to resources and this will lead to conflict, uh, conflict of all times, having to do with jurisdiction between different towns. Uh, there will be conflict between lords because most of uh, I'm making facilities were owned by the lords in Guipúzcoa. And um, they, will be, they, they were the ones that um, had this free access to all the mounts owned by the crown. They owned all the forges and um, now um, they are limited and there will be uh, clashes, of course. Um, there was, that was a time of... Uh, there, was a, uh, there were wars between uh, the lords, the different lords, and that will affect, of course, the different villages. Let's not forget that the village of, Mutrico, of Mondragon was burnt to ashes in 1448. And this is the context where all these uh, limitations are being imposed. Uh, limitations that will also lead uh, to more conflict. Uh, later on, conventions will be signed in order to regulate, uh, to rule about the use of resources and the exploitation of forestry resources in the territory. De todas maneras, vemos que las las medidas coercitivas Oh, you can see there were a number of actions to try and uh, normalize and regulate and improve uh, that problem uh, with deforestation, inverted commas, that is, because when we say deforestation, uh, it's always relative, right? Let me just give you an example. There might be a, a piece of land uh, that uh, would allow for wood to be harvested for charcoal, uh, but not for shipbuilding. Well, uh, I guess ship owners uh, might complain that in that area there is a problem of deforestation, which is not or was not the case. Uh, there was wood, uh, but not for shipbuilding. Uh, but rather for the charcoal industry. So that was the situation more and more uh, after the mid 15th century. More and more, uh, 
institutions and uh, governments uh, understood uh, that forestry practices were important, that certain tree species made more sense than others, that uh, certain practices, for forestry practices, uh, made the industry more reliable or more productive. For instance, the transmocha trees, uh, those trees that are uh, specifically trained uh, for shipbuilding, uh, and Brad Lowen uh, has told us about how archaeology has shown us how these pollards, uh, these transmocha trees, uh, and pollarding uh, is not uh, something recent. Uh, in 1496, for instance, the uh, Catholic monarchs in Spain forbid uh, for trees uh, to be cut down uh, from the very base. The law said uh, that pollarding uh, should be favoured then. And then also plantations were favoured, were uh, promoted more and more starting at that time. No, that was the law, by the way. But uh, then compliance was not particularly good, uh, which is something very, very common at that time. Uh, laws were passed or bills were passed and regulations, but then they, uh, they were not particularly respected. After 1548, uh, there was a more specific regulation uh, saying how each municipality at a local level had to uh, check uh, that plantations were done properly and how much of them and that was the time when pollarding uh, became more common in our territory. So we're talking about changes and replacement, uh, which is not something that happens to, from one day to the next. So uh, it started uh, when I mentioned, but then uh, more and more in the 16th century, uh, that change uh, was intensified uh, as uh, the West Indies fleet and Newfoundland uh, ships had to be larger or could be larger. And also also, you can imagine that um, shipbuilding uh, is more complex as well uh, for a 500-ton ship. For that size ship, uh, you need uh, trees uh, of a certain age, parts would often be more complex in design. So as demand uh, for larger ships grew, that was uh, one more reason uh, for governments uh, to make sure the law was respected and complied with uh, for pollarding to become more common and uh, for plantations uh, to be uh, more common as well. So I hope I have managed uh, to explain how these changes ha played an important role in uh, shipbuilding technology changes between uh, the mid-15th century and the mid-16th century. I think denying uh, those uh, facts and changes uh, would be denying something that's uh, obvious. Those changes happened at the same time and in parallel as a technological uh, evolution and change. Uh, they're very much interconnected and uh, not just with shipbuilding, but also with um, the building of ports and um, uh, the new style of docks, for instance, uh, that we're used to right now uh, with uh, large uh, cut stones, uh, with a binding of mortar uh, and a large pier. Well, that type of port uh, started uh, to be built uh, round about in the mid-15th century. 
before that date, uh, there were not uh, that type of peer and uh, docs, all these uh, technological changes and uh, changes in the economy as well uh, had an impact as well in uh, for instance, Getaria, in 1452, in Getaria, uh, 1563, in Bilbao as well, Legatio in uh, 1568, and so on. So, in the second half of the 15th century, uh, all of them. Well, uh, with this Ahora new lime and pebble café, style. That's all from me. Uh, it is time soon, it will soon be time uh, for coffee break. But uh, before then, uh, maybe uh, we can have a Q&A session for both Fred, Brad and myself. Me he dado cuenta que no os he puesto aquí, que os he puesto todo eh, eh, datos de documentos y de tablas, etc. Pero no os he... Eh, well, no I've os, tried eh, to give you uh, facts and figures uh, and I forgot uh, eh, to show conocidas. some of the very <laughs> beautiful and very well-known images that I brought Maya, for my presentation. For instance, uh, the now, altar at uh, Sumaya Church uh, with that beautiful now that would have traveled at that time between the Mediterranean and the Atlantic uh, and I also forgot uh, to show you up on the screen um, a pretty picture of Apollo. Never mind. So it's the Q&A session now. So who's going to break the ice? Good morning. You were talking about uh, the tonnage uh, between 100 and 150 tons, sorry, and 200 tons. Uh, why do we have that range, particular range? Uh, do we know because of taxes or dues paid at ports? Se ha caído cerca. Sí. Ha afectado la pregunta. Es una interpretación. Realmente es una interpretación. To be honest, is more of an interpretation, my own interpretation. Mostly thinking about uh, the final destinations uh, of those routes and journeys or voyages. Smaller ships under 150 tons uh, were mostly geared uh, for certain activities. Although you are quite right in asking that question, sometimes uh, we have uh, a very different situation. There might be cases when a very small ship, uh, 25 tons only, it was just a, a nutshell to be honest, uh, went to Ireland for instance. But that's not uh, the most common situation. So it's mostly, I mostly focus on usage. But then uh, the truth is that uh, when we label a ship as 
now or as what, uh, those labels, uh, for, for that labeling, tonnage is important as well. For instance, anything over 150 tons were not called caravels. They were all nows. Under 50 tons, for instance, well, there's more of a variety uh, and you could call it a now or a caravel. For instance, now Victoria, right? Uh, in some documents I have seen, uh, they refer to it as a caravel. In other documents, uh, they call it a now. And it's not just for Victoria. For instance, San Antonio, 120 tons in that case. Uh, some documents refer to it as a caravel. So, uh, that's how I subjectively decided uh, to uh, place those limits. And then thinking about the smaller, the smaller vessels, uh, I've, I have not found any nows called nows uh, under 80 tons. I have found a few cases uh, of uh, vessels called or referred to as nows uh, with 80 tons. Anything smaller is a caravel. And then the, another uh, important landmark is 40 tons. Uh, Anything under 40 tons might be uh, a pinaza or that there might be other terms, but not a caravan anymore, right? Those are the trends I have observed, and as a result of that, uh, I decided to have those categories. Well, my question uh, is thinking about the current situation, uh, the current regulation, where 150 tons is uh, the limit uh, for a number of different things. And I was just wondering, oh, is that something old or is it? Because obviously regulations uh, have changed. Um, over the years, uh, but 150 tons uh, seems to be significant, right? Well, to be honest, tonnage uh, is not a simple matter. When, when I talked about 150 tons, it sounds easy, but uh, to be honest, uh, when a document says, oh, this ship is 80 toneles and a cask, uh, rather than tons. <laughs> en otras ocasiones eh, vemos que se refieren a, a, a dimensiones distintas. Then, uh, there are times when uh, macho, they talk about tonel, cask, as in paro, as opposed to tons, and they make a clear no, difference no, between no, those two, but not always. No, no sabría, <laughs> so. No sabría, it's, it's not a simple matter, and uh, I can't uh, tell you about the conversion between cask, tonel, and ton. It seems to change uh, over time, uh, or from one area to another, or uh, different people. Or, well, uh, the same thing, as I said, about uh, what to call a vessel, a now or a caravel. Uh, where is the limit? Uh, it's not a clear cut limit. So I don't like calling them a caravel or a now. I, I've been talk or a carac. Uh, I've been talking about ships or vessels in general. For instance, uh, did caracs ever get to our area? For instance, well, I, I have some doubts. 
uh, it is true that documents uh, talk about larger vessels of over 400 or 500 tons uh, as now or Carac. But then uh, Cristóbal de Barros uh, said, uh, well, uh, people used to talk about Caracs, but they really should have called them large nows. And in fact, they were not that big, and they made themselves look bigger sometimes uh, to get some privileges from the Spanish crown. So, once again, names and tonnage uh, is not a simple conversion, a simple comparison uh, with the facts and figures that we have at the moment. A question at the back. I was thinking that uh, I understand there were different vested interests uh, at different times in the Spanish crown, uh, the trade industry and shipbuilders. But I was thinking about uh, how those larger or smaller ships would sail safely across the oceans. Uh, were they safe? Particularly thinking about the smaller ones. Uh, is it just me thinking that uh, a larger vessel would be safer uh, to sail across the ocean? Is that is that right? Well, to be honest, that's not my field of expertise. I could tell you about how, from the point of view of economy, it makes sense. It made sense to have larger or smaller ships. That's why I said that initially, uh, sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, for instance, uh, it all started with smaller ships. It was an age of discovery and exploration, so it made more sense uh, to have a vessel that you could maneuver uh, more easily, that could, could be more multi-purpose, uh, uh, that could hide more easily uh, in case of danger, much more so than a larger vessel. And then, uh, as time went by, uh, the route uh, became institutionalized, shall we say, and safer, then logically the larger the vessel, uh, the more profitable the voyage. And because of that, in the second half of the 16th century, we observe that trend uh, in shipbuilding for larger ships, and then there were vested interests uh, in politics, uh, because the Spanish crown uh, gave uh, aid and exception, exemptions and uh, certain privileges uh, to uh, ships. And even loans to the larger ships, more and more. So, uh, once again, politics and economy. What's, uh, what about uh, how safe they were? Well, I think Grant can probably tell you a lot better about their sea-keeping abilities. I'm very ignorant about uh, shipbuilding, not just at that time, but any time. Well, um, I, I think that we have a really good expert here, which is uh, who is Xavi, Xavi Aragote, who has crossed the Atlantic uh, rowing. Um, and I think he will confirm that the most dangerous part of any voyage is not the Atlantic, it's the coast. Um, when I, in, in my own historical research, which is not as much as uh, Xavier has done, um, it, it's always a surprise to see a ship that has less than 80 tons to cross the Atlantic, but you see them regularly. You see ships of 35 tons, uh, you see ships of 50 tons, uh, but usually not less than that. There are some examples of very long voyages in a chalupa, for instance, uh, over 1,000 kilometers along the coast. Um, 
I don't think it's very different to sail 10 kilometers or a thousand kilometers. You're always sailing. And also the ocean uh, does not have the same dangers as the coastline does. Um, the biggest dangers of the ocean are unexpected, very large storms. And uh, these sailors know how to sail in these storms. I think the, co the most dangerous part is, is always the coast. Archaeologists would tend to confirm that. That's where we find the wrecks. What do you think, Xavi? I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Bueno, esta es una, una pregunta sorpresa. Eh, a bit of a surprise question. And answer for me. I totally agree. The main dangers uh, are uh, along the coast. Uh, I think historians uh, made a bit of a myth of the first uh, European uh, to get to America, for instance. Which is not true. Uh, for instance, uh, a voyage uh, from here to Norway or Belgium uh, is probably more dangerous than going to Newfoundland or the Caribbean. Because uh, it's a huge ocean in between the continents, uh, we, we find that impressive, right? Uh, but uh, the motorways, the, it's like, like, like uh, driving on a motorway as opposed to a small country lane when you want to uh, have a shortcut, right? On land. Uh, oceanic uh, voyages, it is true that uh, we mostly have uh, ships of over 80 toneles or casks, he says, uh, and mostly because of uh, food. Uh, they had to take enough food with them. Uh, we're talking here about the Victoria now, the now Victoria, and in the second uh, voyage, Elcano found uh, the Pacific Ocean was a lot larger than they thought. And, well, they knew that first time round, right? And then in their second voyage, uh, they learned from that, and their ships were larger, uh, quite simply, uh, because of uh, food and water supplies for them to be able to survive the voyage. But uh, you only have to uh, put a message in a bottle, uh, throw it uh, in the ocean. Uh, if it doesn't hit a rock on the coast, by the way, it's not going to sink. It just goes. And because I have my mic, uh, can I take advantage of this? Can I ha ask Brad a question? Brad. Uh, you talked about trasmochos, right? And local historians like Álvaro Aragón, he's here with us, he doesn't call them uh, trasmochos, he calls them ipiñabarros, uh, meaning they were pretty sophisticated uh, pollards, uh, specific for shipbuilding, which is a technique uh, which I, I don't know if it's been used in other areas around the world. In Europe, is that technology found anywhere else? Uh, well, we certainly found it in Canada, uh, in, in Newfoundland and in New Brunswick, as recently as the early 20th century. Now, these are not oak trees. These are not deciduous trees. These are uh, pines and, and what we call, uh, in our language, we call them cedars. These are tuya occidentalis. Uh, these are, so these are trees that uh, don't naturally produce the shapes that shipbuilders are interested in. So there is a tradition in Newfoundland and in Nova Scotia every spring to go into the forest, the natural forest, and to tie ropes to trees and bend them over so that in 20 years or 30 years you will have the right shape for the bow or other timbers like that. Yes, these, um, these traditions are documented in Newfoundland by, uh, by Taylor. Um, and I've talked to old people in New Brunswick who actually remember doing this. Pero 
En Europa, en la época que nos concierne, siglo XVI, siglo XV, tenemos constancia de que se utilicen esas técnicas forestales en otros lugares. Me refiero porque sabemos que en la enciclopedia francesa eh, hace una, ciertas elucubraciones sobre cómo se debería hacer eh, desarrollar esa técnica, pero eh, parece ser sin llevarla a cabo nunca, como, y además como si no hubiera precedentes, como si no hubiera existido anteriormente, ¿no? Eh, por eso, me gustaría saber si es un caso propio de nuestros bosques o si también se ha eh, extendido. From a... our Basque forestry, or can it be found anywhere else? No, no, it's not specific to to the Basque country. It was most developed here, I think. But there are other places where where you run into it as well. Um, Liguria, uh, Liguria, Liguri. Uh, there are examples of family crests. These family crests that actually show trees in the Trasmoto style, uh, where forest owners actually constructed their family identity around these techniques. Um, the English historian, naval historian Robert Albion, in the last page of his book, he, show, he shows illustrations of how this was done in England as well. That would have probably been in the 19th century. Um, There are uh, uh, illustrations from colored manuscripts in Italy around Venice that show these techniques in the early 18th century that show how trees are, the, the branches are partially cut uh, so that you can shape them better. Uh, so several techniques are illustrated like that in the Venetian context. So we find them in Liguria, around Genoa, around Venice, in England. Um, in uh, Western France, that is southern Brittany, uh, um, to as far south as the Nantes and um, Gatineau area, or Gatineau area, uh, in the early 18th century, there are, there are accounts as well that were recorded by Duhamel de Monceau that showed how these bocage, so these are rows of trees that grew between different fields, how these trees were allowed to grow and they, their shapes were cultivated in order to produce timber for ships. Uh, so yes, these are probably residual practices that were used to produce specialized timbers like knees and, and uh, floor timbers. But yes, you see them in a lot of parts of the world. What I think is different in the Basque country um, is that with the um, encouragement of the Spanish crown, there were subsidies for planting oaks, uh, and also there, was this, there were subsidies for building ships of a certain tonnage. Uh, as a result of these subsidies, um, the, sh the forestry practices became more organized and were regulated by these laws. These are, we attribute these to the, to the Spanish crown, which uh, came into play around 1492, but the uh, foras, the older Basque traditions, also show these timber subsidies going back to the Middle Ages. So this is a really old practice that uh, probably can, can be picked up uh, as early as the 14th century, and maybe archaeology will show it even earlier. Bueno, pues, eh, brevemente porque tenemos que pasar al café. Sí. Quick question, because otherwise coffee is going to go cold. Sí, bueno, yo quería preguntarte si... Pues, I have a question. I was thinking uh, when the Basque nows uh, were in the Mediterranean and in the Atlantic, do we know anything about them being present around the Canary Islands? That's right. And in the Gulf of Guinea or fishing in the around the Atlantic African coast. We know Basque fishermen and tradesmen and uh, merchant uh, ships were present. Although around the Canary Islands, uh, it's mostly the Western Mediterranean inhabitants who um, 
Pero sí hay también referencias. Eh, dominated that area uh, from southern Spain, uh, the Huelva area, although there, there is there are there is evidence of past presence as well. So uh, enjoy your coffee, and we'll be back soon.